And so we are stewards, we are not owners. Let me just give you one little illustration because either you are there or you were a teenager yourself. It's, a, it's called what I, the stewardship problem is actually the teenager problem. So either you have had this thought or you will have this thought when you have a steward, when you have a teenager. You'll have this thought. Uh, this is not your house. And then you'll say something that your parents said to you. As long as you're living in my house, you're going to live by my rules. Is that right? Okay. So I'm wondering if God... has a teenager problem. People who are living in his house that don't think it's his house, they think it's their house. And that they can live by whatever rules they want to live by. How y'all doing? You got me today. Uh-huh. Buckle your seatbelt. Those of you that are online, you forgot it's time change. You better be watching. Get on Facebook and post this thing. Tell them, listen to it. It's really important stuff. I like that guy right there. He's mentored by the same guy that spent four weeks mentoring me, Jack Hayford. That's the pastor at Gateway. They got several campuses, a very huge church in Dallas. And I love that. I thought, well, I should just say what he said there. I thought, no, I can't say it as good as, as Robert Moore said it. That was a pretty good little thing, wasn't it? You know, I like that, didn't you? Okay, so I'm going to talk about money. Don't, where are you going? Okay, don't, don't, don't turn me off here. Listen, Jesus had a lot to say about money in this red letter edition. A lot about money, a lot about hell, and that's the number one thing people don't want to hear about. But the point of money isn't about giving or raising money. That's not my point. It's about your heart. It's about your heart, about my heart, our hearts, right? And the whole point of Jesus talking about hell is because he says we have to repent because we are selfish and sinful as humans born that way, messed up in every area. Our sensitivity is messed up. Our, our anger is messed up, our greed is messed up, our lust is messed up, our view of the world is messed up because it's all me-centric. And so God has to change our heart. And the number one thing I pray at the close of the service is you'll sincerely pray, God, change my heart. Change my heart. Because that's the only way we can be right with God. Money's an important issue, and we got to get it right. Jesus talked a lot about it. And we need to get it right. Are you with me? I'm not preaching this because we need money. I'm preaching it because we need our hearts right toward God. I'm going to put some statements. Everybody get your phones out. Get it on camera. Everybody, come on, quick. Get them out. Get them on camera. I need you to hurry. Come on, do this. I got a lot to say. I'm going to put some statements up here. I learned these from my mentor that I worked with for 13 years, Pastor Ray Weeks. He taught me all of these things, and I'm not going to preach on these things, but I'm going to do. So look, go ahead and put the first one up. The first one is priorities can be clearly seen. Take a picture of it. Priorities can be clearly seen by looking at your bank statement where you're spending your money, your calendar, how you're spending your time, and your prized possessions, what you value most. Everybody get a picture of it? You're good? We're going to take lots of pictures. Keep your camera up and focused. Blow it up. Take lots of pictures here. Second thing, there's about 12 of them. Get ready. Live within your means and live below your means, if at all possible. Next one. Don't loan what you can't afford to lose. You get bitter. Don't do it. The Bible even talks about this. An important principle. Okay, what's next? Pay God's tithe. We give offerings. We pay the tithe because the tithe belongs to the Lord. Give systematically. 
Giving systematically is difficult in our culture because we're running to and fro. We miss church a lot. When you got 1.7 Sundays a month as, a, as an average attendance of a, of, a, of a solid Christian, you know you're missing almost three Sundays a month. That means you're not here to give, and most people don't give when they're not here. So I have friends that have told me, and my, some of my family do this, they set it up online, on the online giving, and they transfer from their checking account to the church checking account, it costs 30 cents. If you use a credit card, it costs 3% or 4%. I don't even know. So please use the check. Set it up so that when you're not here, it goes. And honor God. And then during the offering, pray and worship God and declare Him first in your life. Give systematically. Make sure it's regular. Just like you save systematically so that you have provision when you're an old geezer like me and you get just a few more years. I'm just a few more years. Uh, I look pretty young, don't I? But a few more years when I'm going to dip into some money that I put aside. It's not wrong to have money. It's wrong for money to have you. The next thing, be generous with God's money. Take a photo. It's God's money, so be generous with it. You remember Pastor Zach last, last week preached a phenomenal message, and you need to go back and listen to it if you missed it. But he had a, a, an illustration of, uh, was it beans? And he put some in his hand, and then he closed the hand, and now you can't get any more. Nothing else comes. But the, God's blessing is meant to flow through us. So what you receive, release. You receive, release. So that more and more can come, you receive and release because He's using you as a vessel of love, of truth, and a blessing. God wants to pour through. He's looking for people that, will, that will, He will allow them, that He will bless to give a lot of resource so He can flow through it and they don't hoard it but it goes out and it does good. Are you with me? So be generous because God's money. The love of money is the root of all evil. That's in Scripture right there. Not money, love of money. You got your cameras up? Don't worry about being annoying. Get your cameras up there and take it. Here's a good one. People find money for what is important to them. If it's important, you're going to find the money. Right? People, some, Pastor Weiss would say to me, he said, people got money, James. That's not the problem. They don't give because it's not important. They, just, they got money for everything else they want. Next one, don't live today on tomorrow's money. It's going to cost you a lot. Don't live today on tomorrow's money. Here's the next one. Don't make as much money as you can. Otherwise, you'll be working when you should be doing something more important. Right? Don't make as much money as you can, otherwise you'll be working when you should be doing something more important. It's not okay to make all the money you can. Here's the next one. Don't swipe a credit card unless you already have the money to pay for what you're buying. Credit cards should never be used to borrow money. If you don't have the money, don't get it. Now, I understand sometimes you get backed up into a wall, and that might be exceptions because you're actually using it to borrow some money, but be careful with that. You want to borrow money, hopefully get some good credit and then borrow it at a better rate than 18% or whatever those credit cards are. Next thing, only use credit cards for convenience and bookkeeping records and rewards. I like mile, reward miles, right? But if you pay it off, you're not paying interest. It doesn't cost you anything. It gives you a good bookkeeping. It's convenient. And but you need to pay off your credit cards completely every month. Take a picture of that, some of you credit card people. Yeah, don't laugh, just do it. It might hurt. Take a photo and read it, put it up on your mirror. This one Pastor Zach covered, but it's got to be said again, love people, not money. Use money, love people, right? Love people and use money. And, that, and then the last one is don't keep score. Listen, this is Christians like, these are super spiritual Christians that everything they do, they want something back for it. Well, I'm, you know, I've tried to be their friend. Nobody will be a friend back. Baloney. People are people everywhere you go. Just keep doing it. You're looking at it backwards. If you're being a friend and going, they won't be a friend back, who cares if they're a friend back? Just keep being a friend. It didn't ask, it didn't ask you what you're going to get back from anything. Just do it. Don't keep scoring, including with your friends. Give without strings attached. If you treat someone, don't expect that they're going to treat you back. And then I've got two that you want to write down that are not up there. They're so obvious, and I've said them so many times, most of you are to be able to complete my sentence. Let's just see who can. It's not equal giving that matters, but equal what? 
sacrifice. Not equal giving that matters, but equal sacrifice. And the second one, live for the things that money can't buy and the things that death can't take away. Eternal things. Money can't buy it. And if you die, it doesn't go away. Pastor Zach read in Matthew 6, this is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the words of Jesus, lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't come in and destroy, where thieves can't break in and steal. Send your treasures to heaven, do something good, bless people, use that money as a spiritual means, right? Now I'm going to read a couple of passages and I'm not really going to preach from them, but I'll later refer back to them. And the first passage I'm going to read is about about the law, because a lot of people go, well, you pastor, you're going to preach on tithing. That's a legalistic. That's a law. Yeah, it's the law, all right, but so is thou shalt not commit adultery. And Jesus, in the same passage I'm about to read later, says, I, you, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I say, don't lust in your heart. Another one, he says, hey, uh, you've heard it said, the law says, don't kill. And I say, don't hate without a cause. Don't hate. You know, malice is you're so angry, you're so bitter, you're so hurt, you want bad stuff, and you rejoice if something bad happens to somebody because you hate them. This is an issue of the heart, right? And giving is an issue of the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, that's what we speak, that's what we give, and you're going to see it. And we need God to help us in every area of our life, area of our life, to change our hearts. Here's the passage, Matthew 5, 17 to 20. Matthew 5, this is Jesus. We're in the red letter edition, the Bibles that have red letters. A lot of them are marking what Jesus said with red letters. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke of a pen. In other words, he's going to dot every I and cross every T. Not any of it will be by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the, one of the, of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of, of God, heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness, now this is it right here, unless your righteousness surpasses the, that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they didn't commit adultery, they didn't steal, and they tithed to the perfect, even meant everything. But the problem was what they were doing was a rule following and it had no heart. There was no love for God. There was no worship to God in their tithing. There was no worship to God in their giving. There was no worship to God and out of their heart in obeying the chemical because you're preferring others and you're loving your neighbor as yourself. There's no, there's no worship to God in just being a religious rule follower. That's external controls of religion. This is internal spirit changing of heart that changes how you see the world when the Spirit of God makes you new. You see the world different. You feel about things differently. You think about things differently. And you understand the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God principles that are forever. And then you will live for the things that money can't buy and death can't take away from you. The invisible, eternal things. Matthew 13, 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. It's a parable of Jesus. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went, he sold all he had and bought that field to get that treasure. In this parable, the treasure is Jesus. The treasure is faith, is God. And he's worth all that we have. The next parable is right after it. It says the same thing again. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Jesus is worth selling everything. He's worth giving our all. Now, I got these tables up here because I'm going to do an illustration later. And this is up here so you can see around me and the table so you can see this illustration. Are you okay with that? Because I, for one, really like my big wood pulpit with the cross on it. It also covers up a couple things going on here. <laughs> now, 
the next one is a parable about a rich man and the kingdom of God. These are all kingdom of God principles and parables. Matthew 19, 16 to 26. Now, this is not saying, this is not, this is, this, God looks at the heart. Only God knows, only can judge eternity for each person, whether they're right with God and going to enter into heaven. Only God can figure that out, not me. And I'm not, don't mishear what I'm saying. I'm just reading a story, okay? But this is Jesus telling the story. Just then a man came up to Jesus and he asked, Matthew 19, starting at 16, and he asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Now there again, you heard me say it, the word keep doesn't mean perfectly obey. It means set your course by the commandment of God. That's your purpose of living. You're going to live in obedience to God's word. That's my heart. That's my course. I turn from myself. I say, not my will. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. That's repenting. To say, I will follow after you and obey your commands. I will. That's my desire. Keep is a sailor word here in the original. And it has to do with the sailors would keep the stars. In other words, to set their course on the ocean, they would see which direction they're going because they knew, they knew uh, the, the, the stars. They would follow after uh, the stars, and they, they knew where they were headed that way. And just like the sailors follow the stars, we follow for a course of our life the Word of God, the commands of God, that we keep them and set that as what we want to follow. Is that your heart? If it's not, then it just shows you that, that in, in, inside we're all born with selfishness and sin. It's just who we are. And we have to help God change our heart. You have to ask God, you can't change your heart, and I can't convince you to change. To, to do something. If you don't cry out to God, nothing will change. You'll, you'll feel miserable because you'll hear what I say is right and you'll never want to until God changes your desire and gives you power and he gives you a want to. That's changing your heart to a God kingdom mentality instead of a temporary earth mentality. So he says, which ones, he says, should I obey? Which ones should I keep? Jesus replied, well, you should not murder should not commit adultery, should not steal, you shall not give false testimony, don't lie, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. That kind of takes all of a lot of the other ones in, right? This guy, this rich guy says, hey, all these I've kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? Let me ask you something, what do you still lack? He, there was something missing in him. He had a hole, there was something not right. You know, I don't know if Jesus' presence was making him realize it, but something, he said, what shall I like? What's wrong with me? Why, inside my heart, what, why, don't I, why don't I know I have this eternal? What is wrong in here? What do I like? What do you lack? In any area of your life, what is missing in your heart's desire that God wants? And then he says, Jesus answered, well, if you want to be perfect or mature, you want to be spiritual and grow up, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven yeah treasure in heaven lay up for yourselves pastor zach said quoting jesus treasures in heaven treasures in heaven give it ahead and then come follow me follow me give it up and follow me well the young man heard this he went away sad because he had a lot of wealth and then jesus said to his disciples truly i tell you it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, and they asked, well, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You see, we have to be right about money. God's going to challenge our heart. We have to be right about money, because money is temporary. It feeds flesh. Jesus talks a lot about money. It's easy to be wrong about money, wrong about giving, wrong information about money, wrong about managing money, wrong attitudes about money, wrong attitudes about giving, wrong attitudes about saving, just wrong. Money is something that we have to get right. It's important in our lives. Now, for those of you that haven't been here long, when I started the church, and you can ask Dale's one of our deacons. He and Madeline came with me, and there's Mike and Roxanne and a few. And they know we established we're going to fix it. We're the keeping of the records. The pastors can't see. No one's looking at. 
We have right now seven teams of individuals that count seven weeks. You give on week two, week three doesn't know what you're giving. There's no way someone can know you're not giving or you're whole giving above. Whatever's going on, I don't know, so I'm doing this with a clear conscience. You got that? And I'm not doing this message to raise money. You can think so, you're wrong. And I don't want to know because it doesn't help me. However, let me hear this. God knows what you give and don't give, and he cares. He's made it plain, doesn't he? He's care. And you, we need to pray God. It's a big deal. We need to change, ask God to change our heart in every way. Have God's heart. Statistics show that 30% of, of true evangelical Christians tithe, 30%. Three out of ten. That simply, tithe means one-tenth, give one-tenth. And uh, some of you, maybe you're new to the faith, you're new to church, you don't know anything about what God says about giving or money or stewardship. And I pray that you don't just hear from me this morning, but you hear from God through the Word. Some of you are very sad when I bring up tithing or giving because your spouse, sp spouse, your spouse won't let you tithe. Spouse. That's old man for spouse, spouse. Your spouse won't let you tithe. You want to, but it's a big problem. Some of you are afraid to tithe because you've never done it before and you don't think you can make ends meet if you give one-tenth. How do you do that? And some of you are mad at me or mad every time money gets brought up at the church saying that's all the church cares about is money, money, money. That's all they want. It's just legalistic religion. Well, hear me loud and clear. I am not speaking on this topic to raise money for the church. Okay? The church is financially strong, gone up in giving every year. I don't speak on this as much as most people do, but it is a really important spiritual topic and it could be spoke on more. I'm speaking on this because, listen to me, it has to do with your heart and my heart. It's a heart issue. Money and giving, greed, it's all a heart issue. The rich young ruler that walked away from Jesus said had a heart problem. Jesus said you can't serve both God and money. Same chapter, Pastor Zach again, hit it out of the park. Can't serve both. You serve the one other. That same passage talks about trusting God for our provision. The birds, they're provided for. The lilies, they're clothed. You're going to have a place to, 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 for shelter. You're going to have food. You're going to be clothed. You're going you're to be okay. God's going to help take care of you. Don't worry. And, and, and so... This, this rich young ruler, he went away sad because his money owned him. And God's kingdom wasn't worth everything to him. Is God worth it? The first fruits? Is Jesus worth it? The first fruits? He wasn't willing to sell everything to go and buy the field with the treasure worth more than anything or to purchase that pearl of great price to sell everything and take his money and get the one thing that mattered most. The mat the, what matters most is Christ Jesus' relationship with God. We're responsible, folks, to deliver God's gift, whether we, and, and also to use our strength to serve him, to serve in the early childhood, to serve like so many of you do. You're a great church in that way, an awesome church in that way. And, um, and, to, and to let money flow through us. Pastor Zach preached last, study, last week and he gave this illustration. You need to go back and watch it online where he had beans. I don't know why he picked beans unless he's just full of gas. I'm not sure, but he had beans. And he had somebody throw some beans in his hand and close it up. And he's going, you know, this is all you can get when you hold on to everything given to you. But if you'll receive from God and then let it go, he'll pour more in. And then let it go, and he pours more. And then you let it go. He wants to use you as a channel to flow through you. He's looking for people that he can bless to be givers. There's the gift of giving. Did you know that? And that you have faith and that you're, you're not greedy and you're okay with taking risks to build something big to make more money so the money can flow through you to a world world needing Jesus. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. We're responsible to deliver what God gives us. We're, we're a kingdom of God children. We're a peculiar people. 
you know, peculiar because God's first, peculiar because we do opposite of what the world does. We give, we don't take, right? We forgive, we don't hold bitterness, we're opposite. You see, we're peculiar because we belong to God. His kingdom's different than the earthly kingdom. It's eternal and invisible. We're different because we, like the song says, say, I'm yours, Lord. Everything I've got, everything I'm not, everything, I'm yours, Lord. Try me now and see. See if I can be completely yours. God, I'm all yours. Now, that, that whole line right there and this whole thing about giving our life, it's all of us, is like, it's, uh, it's like water baptism. You know, when you're baptized in water, and we got one coming up, it's, baptism isn't Jesus' suggestion, it's his command, be, repent, be baptized, right? He was baptized. What that is, is you're living your life, and you say, I repent, I run from my sin, I run to Jesus, I'm going to lay my life down for him and not live what I want, not use my money for what I want, not use my talents for what I want, not be selfish with everything God give me. I'm buried with him in baptism. I'm under the water. I'm dead to myself. I'm alive to his will. And you come up alive in Christ and you're living for him and you're full of his spirit and old things are passed away, that scripture says, and all, all things become new because you're all in. You're all in, right? You step in. It's not just a part of you. It's all of you you give to God. You're all in the bucket. You're just all the way. My car is God's car. You use it for his kingdom. My house is God's house. You use it for his kingdom. My kids and my grandkids are God's kids. Right? If, they, if, they're, if God calls them to go to the mission field, it's not my place to say something negative or be angry at God or say, where are they at? Because Everything we are is God's. We're all the way in. Jesus is Lord. And let me tell you, the tithe represents, every time I give the first fruit, the 10% first, it represents that I'm all in, that he is all that I have. And it reminds me that God owns everything, and I'm only a manager. I'm a manager. I'm a steward. You say, well, I've worked hard for my money. I'm a self-made man. Really? Who gave you breath? Who formed you in your mother's womb? Listen to me. Most people live for the wow factor. Here's what I mean. Wow, look at that car of yours. That is the coolest car. Woo, look at that. They live for the wow factor. Wow, look at that house of yours. Woo, that is a beautiful. Look how, that is amazing. Look at those clothes. Look at you. Look, woo, don't, man, look at those high heels. Woo, woo. Look at that funny looking hair, Pastor Luke. That's looking hot, 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 hot. <laughs> wow, look at that guy. Wow. But instead of living for the wow factor, listen to me. Listen to me. Instead of living for the wow factor, live for the well done factor. The well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm not here to manipulate you just to get money from you. You can accuse me of that if you want, but you don't really know me. It's not true. I want your heart to be right towards God's money. And I'm not doing this because the pastors need to make more. Dale, how many times have I turned down salary raises? It's been a long time since I've had a raise, right? Because what is my philosophy? That the pastors live in the median of the congregation. I'm not a CEO. I'm a pastor of big churches, a pretty good-sized church, but I'm not some fat cat pulling this big fat thing down. Like the Pharisees and the, 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 the high priest and the chief priest, and they would take all the money, and I've been and seen their houses and the ruins. And then the synagogues in the country, they starved those priests, right, Gary? They, they were starving. They were full of themselves. Here... All pastors are pastors, and they're all important, and they all matter, and they all have a pastor's heart. They all have something to say, and they all get paid good because they're valuable, and it wouldn't be right for me to treat them like a peon and take the big bucks, right? So there's a time when some of us, we've reached the pinnacle, and I haven't got taken a raise, nor would I, for a long time. So that's the way it is. That's, enough is enough. I don't need more and more and more. Second Corinthians, this is my heart for you. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, the Apostle Paul says, each of you should give what you decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, not reluctantly, nor out of compulsion, because I'm trying to manipulate you, 
God loves a cheerful giver. I want your heart to be cheerful in giving to God's kingdom. This happens when our spirit is awakened by God, that we understand God owns everything. We're only stewards. God trusts us to steward everything we have. It is His, and we're managers. And what is a steward? A steward, here's the definition. Watch the board. Someone the owner trusts to manage his assets. A steward. Someone the manager, the owner trusts to manage his assets. The first point is God owns everything. We're managers. I'm going to read a few scriptures. You can take pictures if you want or write them down. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's everything in it, the world, all who live in it. Haggai 2, 8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. Deuteronomy 8, 18. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce work, wealth, and so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your ancestors as it is today. 1 Chronicles 29, 12. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. God gives us the strength, right? And then even our whole being, our very bodies, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Listen, God owns everything. We're managers, only stewards, and God is trusting us to manage his assets. A steward doesn't say, how much of my money am I going to give to God? A steward understands it's not yours. How much of God's money am I going to keep to live on? That's what they say. When we know God owns everything, we'll have a kingdom mindset, a kingdom of God. When we think we own it, then you know what? It's a temporary earthly mindset. The concept of laying up treasures in heaven makes no sense to us in the kingdom, or the kingdom of God it doesn't make sense. Or seeking first the kingdom of God, it doesn't make sense. We have an earthly, temporary mindset. This is our stuff, our life, our talents, our time, our money for right here. Take it, get it all you go. You know, have it your way, Burger King. Go for the gusto. You only go around once. No, it's all God's. Money and all that we have belongs to God belongs to God to build his kingdom. His kingdom come, his will be done. We're managers only. One, God owns everything and we're only managers. Two, acknowledge his ownership with the tithe. Acknowledge his ownership with the tithe. When I tithe, I acknowledge he owns everything. You remember the tree in the Garden of Eden? Don't eat of the fruit of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's one tree. The rest of it they could have, but they had to take from God. That tree represents the first fruit. That tree represents first. God gave his first fruit. He gave his son Jesus. The Bible says he's the first fruit among the brethren raised from the dead. You will too raised from the dead. Listen, he needs the first fruit. It's not okay. Proverbs 3, 9. We're going to read some scriptures. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. All your crops. Genesis 14, 19 and 20. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, Creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to the God most high, who delivered your enemies into hand. Then Abram gave a tenth of everything. Leviticus 27, 30, a tithe of everything from the land, where the grain from the soil or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And then Malachi says this. Oh, I knew you were thinking, don't read that Malachi deal to me. If you know the Bible, 3, 7 to 10, ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees, decrees, law, and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, Jesus, the, the word of God says, God says, but you ask, how, how are we to return? What do you mean? How do we return? And then God says, will a, mortal, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? God says in tithes and offerings. You pay the tithe, you give the offering. It's both. In other words, if you don't give out of the heart and you give them out of the legal, you just give the tithe, you're still robbing God because God wants some of the rest of it for his offerings. It says you're under a curse. Holy cow, I'm glad the Bible says that and not me. Your whole nation, because you're robbing me, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That's the church. So where can you pay your tithe? My grandmother, no. To, to the United Way, no. Let the heathens give the United Way. There's a lot of heathens that like to give. Let them give to all those other things. The, the tithe bongs are story. It's God's program. He set up pastors and teachers and, and apostles and prophets, etc. And he established a church. 
He established an organized church. He established this, what we have, where we're brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, the Spirit giving us gifts, ministering to each other, and the storehouse is the church. The tithe belongs to the church, not a district. There's where I stand. Belongs to the church, not a parachurch organization. Belongs to the church, the local church, where you're in fellowship to work for God. Bring the whole tithe in the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there will not be room enough to, to store it. How many experience that? You know God is not a, he's a rewarder of the faithful. He's never a debtor, right? So I got these tables up here. I'll do an illustration. I got some friends that will come help me here. Would you do that? Okay, right, this table right here, this is the God table. This is the tithe table. This is the tenth. This table is going to be our table, the 90% right here, the 90%, okay? And so this belongs to God. This is, belongs to the Lord, all right? And I just want you to visualize this. Pastor Jeff, are you going to help me? Where'd you go? There he is. How's your pancreas, bro? How's your pancreas? Is that bothering you to carry that? You're doing good? All right. Okay. Yep. You're doing good. Yep. That's good. You know what you're doing, don't you? That's good. That's water. You know what this water is, guys? This is one step water. This is why everybody should shop at Hy-Vee and only Hy-Vee. You know why? Because they give all their profits from their one step products for water around the world. Through our Africa Aces, a part of the Assemblies of God, they bless through our program 200,000 from the profits from this water. All right? And you know what? There's other one step products. This is one step potatoes. All the proceeds from one step potatoes right here go to feed the world. Right? And the cereal that's about to come out is one step cereal. And all the profits go to feed the world. Now, what other grocery store does that? None of them. And when I was buying it this morning before the crows were awake, I want to tell you that the, even the employees in the store didn't know that their company did that. So let the whole world here shop at High V. <laughs> I'd rather pay more. Actually, they have a good deal. You, you can do just as good. You just got to be smart. But anyway, here, here we go. We bring it all the first thing. Listen, it's a step of faith to start tithing, right? So is it okay? Perhaps you say, well, can I do half a tithe? Well, nowhere, nowhere does it say, just give me half of your life. You want to give half a tithe, 50, you know, 5%? Nowhere it says, give, you, give God half of your life. You just, you know, no, the tithe, you're putting yourself in the bucket every time. You're giving yourself, you're trusting God. And here's the thing. Think of this. Get ready to put some slides up here because I'm going to go back to that scripture. Go to the statistic page. Take pictures of this. Okay, guys, if everybody tithed, right, there'd be 165 billion more in tithe if Christians tithe. 165 billion a year. If each year, for five years, you use that 165 billion, year one, two, three, four, five. At the end of year five, 25 billion a year going could relieve global hunger, starvation, and deaths from preventable diseases in five years of that. 12 billion could eliminate illiteracy just in five years. 12 billion a year for five years. 15 billion a year for five years could solve the world's water and sanitation issues, specifically in places where people live on less than a dollar a day. And one billion a year could fully fund all overseas mission work. And then you'd have a hundred billion of additional money left over for ministry. Think of that. Think of that. I wonder, just think of me, I wonder what we could do if all of us tie. See, I'm not a genius but I know how many families are in it, and I know that people aren't living on $10,000 a year. So that means there are people that give more than a tithe, right? And there are people that don't give a dime, and there's others that tip God, and they give 20 bucks. They pat themselves on the back because they got an earthly kingdom because to them, that's a lot of money. It is if your heart isn't changed. It feels like, oh, I gave 20 bucks. That's good. That's no, 20 bucks. I, you know, that's good. But no, it's not a tithe. 
Very few people live on $200 a week or a month or whatever it is. It's just not okay. So, oh, whoa, there's our portion. You see this? Take a photo of this, guys. Here's God's 10%. Boy, God, you're so lucky to have us give you all this. You know, I think I'm going to have one of your bananas, oh, Lord. I don't know if I've got enough. Will a man rob God? How does he rob God? Tithes and offerings. I'm robbing God's tithe table. Mmm, that's great. That's really good. Mm-hmm. Mm. 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 I might do. I might need that later. Mm. Mm. Goldfish baked. Mm. No, it's not yours. <laughs> she said, "That's mine. Do you want it? Do you want it from this table or this table? This table. Pray for her, will you?" pray for me, but don't we do this right here? Don't we do this? Enough is never enough. Bigger is always better. Live it up. More and more. The more we get, the more we spend. Don't have enough for God's little tithe, you know? Wait a minute. I got an idea. I got an idea. What if I was a man of faith, and I was letting the beans flow through me, and I was letting them go, and I continue to do that, and God blesses me, and I start making $200,000. You're not supposed to talk with food in your mouth, are you? My wife hates that. <laughs> what if you could give 90%? Because after it left over, you still have 60, 70,000 and 10%. What if you're making 700,000 and you give 90% of it and you live on 70,000? Would you do it? Good question, isn't it? Or what if... You take a look at this photo here, you take this picture, and you go, you know, there's starving people. Let me give the benevolence. God, here's some more. I don't want to just give you the 10%. Let me give you some benevolence money. And hey, you know what? Let's give some money to missions. Let's help our missionaries. And let's give them because they need to do the work of God so souls will be saved. So that when I get to heaven, my, my, my fruit doesn't rot and my wealth doesn't rot. I lay treasures up in heaven and if I give more and more and more and more then will God increase so that I can give more and more and more are you seeing the picture where's our heart we look at it this way pretty convicting isn't it I tell you what I don't ever want to eat a celery and banana together again that's pretty <laughs> it's really strange Well, listen, can we use all the money that comes through here for ministry? Are you kidding me? Of course we can. But is that why I preach it? No. I preach it because if your heart isn't right in this area, you've got a real serious problem. And you need to pray, God, change my heart on this. Because if you don't start here, you don't open the windows of heaven of blessing. You bow your head, musicians. Say, Jesus, change my heart. Help me see things the way you see them, God. I, I want to see my own possessions the way you see them. I'm a, I'm a manager of all that's yours. So I want to do a good job managing what you left for me, what you give me, flow through me. Lord, I want to... Uh, I want you to enrich and fill up my barns so that I can pass it off, pass it off, and the more I get, the more I can give. Yeah. I thank you, Lord, that because I've been diligent not to pay interest and not get credit card debt, and been diligent to, in a lot of ways, my house is paid for. I thank you, Lord, I can give way more than a 10%. I thank you that my wife is supportive 
and it's always been not only at the drop of a hat I say can we give 10,000 this she says yes and she's willing to tithe I'm thinking both of my children tithe faithfully and they know that blessing and I've seen the blessing they married people way better than they ever should have ever gotten <laughs> you know that's a humorous prayer but it's true because I believe you honor the heart of a person that puts you first. We want to put you first in everything, in all of our substance. And for that person that you may not sure you're going to heaven, pray this prayer, Jesus, forgive my sins. Change my heart, come into my heart, change my heart. I turn from sin, I repent and I run toward you to follow you and obey you, to keep your commands. Keep your commands, like the rich young ruler, Jesus told the rich to keep your commands be serious about following you in obedience. Thank you, Lord. And I want to follow after you. Teach me your ways. May my life be all in the bucket. And may I honor you in all that I have. Not just money, but time. Not just, not just with my talents, but just with my sweat. To work, to serve in the nursery. It's okay. It's hard, but I, it's good to give myself to serve. Thank you, Jesus. Your people are great people. I'm glad that I can look out th this audience and not know one person that doesn't tithe. I don't know anybody in this place that doesn't tithe. As far as I know, they all do. The math doesn't work out that way. But listen, God, I, I preach this with a clear conscience, and I believe it's why the Holy Spirit, when I was fasting, Father God gave me that thought. So don't look. It's not my business. Don't let anybody look. It's none of our business. Between them and God. But may our hearts be right toward all possessions. For your word says that life doesn't consist of the abundance of things that a man possesses. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll leave you with this last scripture. This is my hope for you. This is what Paul said. 2 Corinthians 8, 7. But since you excel in everything, you Corinthians, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. This past year, I had a corporation owned by members of our church. They called me, they said, Pastor, we're doing good. Something we do individually is we all tithe, and we want to tithe on the profits of our business. And they forthwith, handed me a check for $120,000 on a $1.2 million profit. And you know what I'm praying? Lord, make, let them make $100 million. Amen? Why not? Why not? God can trust them with riches. Amen? And I, don't, I know them well enough to know they don't just give to the penny of the tithe and brag about it like some religious hypocrites and you'll never know who it is because I won't tell you so don't even ask me. But just let me tell you something. Their heart is to give beyond that. They're generous people. Rich people sometimes are the most generous people. That's why they're rich. Abraham was rich. Right? Father of our faith. Shake a leg. What's that song? Father Abraham has many sons. Many sons have Father Abraham. I am one of them. And so are we. So let's just praise the Lord. Right hand. Abraham. <laughs> left arm, right foot, left foot, all of me, everything in the bucket. Let's go home. Bye. I've said it all. <laughs>